So hello everyone and welcome to my talk, Real World Detection Evasion Techniques in the Cloud. So let's kick off with some formalities before we get started on the content for today. First of all, I'm Matt Muir and I'm a Threat Intelligence Researcher at Cado Security. Prior to working at Cado, I was a macOS malware researcher and I've got a background in DevOps, digital forensics, and operational cybersecurity. So you can follow me on Twitter at the handle on screen, and that's if anyone else is actually still on Twitter, of course. And the slides for the talk will also be available to download later today. So as part of Cado Labs, Cado's threat research team, I'm regularly involved in researching new software threats affecting cloud infrastructure. As the name of the talk suggests, I'm here today to talk to you about detection evasion techniques we've observed in various cloud native malware campaigns. The talk will focus on three specific campaigns, all of which we've been tracking over the last year or so. So while the techniques described here are not necessarily exclusive to the cloud, they demonstrate a certain ingenuity and often reveal the attacker's knowledge of the incident response process. So without further ado, I'll first go over the agenda of the talk before diving into some real life examples of detection evasion techniques in the cloud. So I'll kick off this presentation by providing some background around the current state of cloud security and common infection vectors for cloud malware. Next, we'll move on to the first malware family, CoinStomp. As we'll see, CoinStomp is a cloud native malware campaign that exhibits some interesting anti-forensics techniques. We'll then take a look at some recent activities from Watchdog, a name those of you who follow cloud security research will likely be familiar with. Before finally moving on to Denonia, a malware family we discovered earlier this year which we believe may be the first publicly reported campaign to specifically target serverless environments. Finally, I'll wrap up with some considerations about the future of cloud malware and provide you with some references for further research. To begin, I'd like to discuss something that I refer to as the cloud challenge. If anyone saw my talks at B-Sides Vegas or Gurkon in Michigan, they'll likely be familiar with this concept already. Despite a sustained migration to the cloud from companies across the globe, organizations are increasingly susceptible to attacks which are advancing in both severity and sophistication. Recent cloud-focused malware campaigns have demonstrated that adversary groups possess an intimate knowledge of cloud technologies and their security mechanisms. And not only that, but they're using this to their advantage. Cloud compute environments remain an obvious target for such groups. However, we're now also beginning to see a shift of focus towards serverless computing and containers. On top of this, the ease of which cloud resources can be compromised has led to adversary groups competing over potential targets. Now, unfortunately, defenders haven't adapted at the same pace which is a big reason why I'm here to talk to you today. There are a number of reasons for this, with visibility into cloud infrastructure being a commonly cited one. But it's an unavoidable fact that the campaigns I'm going to cover are both successful in achieving their objectives and are widespread. Clearly, attackers in the cloud space are utilizing this to their advantage by employing TTPs aimed at evading detection, foiling attribution, and covering their tracks. With that in mind, I'd like to take a moment to discuss some common cloud infection vectors. People who follow cloud malware research or deal with its remediation will likely be unsurprised by this list, as it doesn't really change very often. Much like other forms of malware, the most prolific cloud native campaigns are opportunistic and generally take advantage of misconfigurations in the target environment. 
Services like Docker and Redis continue to be lucrative targets for these types of attacks. People seem to love exposing the Docker engine API to the internet without authentication for some reason. Similarly, the developers of Redis strongly recommend against exposing their TCP port or Unix socket directly to the internet, even after they went to the effort of implementing a feature that provides optional authentication to the data store. Despite this, a cursory glance of Shodan at the time of creating this presentation shows that almost 50,000 nodes have port 6379 open to the world. Of course, many of these will have authentication enabled, but several won't, and I would imagine that they aren't honeypots either. More sophisticated threat actors will make an effort to exfiltrate credentials post-compromise. We've seen this from people like Team TNT, who are known to use AWS's instance metadata service to retrieve IAM role credentials. In the case of cloud compute instances, we've also seen the contents of local credentials files being exfiltrated in a similar manner. Now on the subject of IAM, earlier this year, Unit 42 published research on the state of permissions management in the cloud. They found that 99% of cloud identities including users, roles, services, and resources, were granted excessive permissions which were ultimately unused. They also found that many built-in provider policies were overly permissive by default, and that these weren't being properly managed by users. This, of course, makes additional compromise of related resources easier and can serve as an infection vector for cloud malware. Finally, Many of the malicious scripts and malware samples that we analyze rely on SSH for propagation, which is an obvious choice in cloud compute environments. Say your cloud compute instance has a vulnerable service running and code execution is achieved. It's very easy for an attacker to enumerate the contents of known hosts, look for a relevant SSH key, and propagate their malware to any nodes that they find. So, after using cloud-specific knowledge to deliver malware via one of the relatively technical infection vectors that we discussed on the previous slide, what do cloud threat actors actually do with their access? Well, they mine cryptocurrency, of course, and often not very much of it. In many ways, I wish this was more exciting, but the reality of the matter is that cryptojacking in the cloud is still an incredibly prevalent threat. Despite it being low-hanging fruit for many campaigns, it doesn't seem to be hugely profitable for the attackers. And this was evidenced by this story from around this time last year. Some of you may remember seeing this, but this developer received an unexpected bill from AWS for $45,000. It turns out that their AWS account had been compromised used to deploy some lambdas, which ran XMRIG, and ultimately mined a measly $800 worth of Monero. Now, this hardly seems worth the effort, given the amount of stress that it likely caused this developer, but I suppose free money is good money. And if you're doing this often enough, you could certainly build up a large payout. Fortunately, this particular issue was settled with AWS, and the fees were eventually waived. Of course, with access to cloud resources, there are a lot more nefarious things you could do. I'm sure everyone has heard of instances where companies have left S3 buckets exposed to the internet and customer data has been exfiltrated. We also often see cloud campaigns making use of malware such as Tsunami, which is used to connect infected machines to a botnet and has DDoS capabilities. So this shows that the impact of cloud breaches is wide ranging and that's unlikely to change. Now, as we'll see, despite the penchant for cryptojacking, cloud threat actors invest significant effort into evading detection and ensuring their miners execute unimpeded. What should concern defenders is how we mitigate these attacks so that when we do eventually see attackers becoming bored of cryptojacking, we're able to detect and prevent more serious threats. On that note, let's move on to discuss our first malware family, CoinStomp. 
CoinStomp is a crypto jacking malware campaign which exploits resources hosted primarily by Asian cloud service providers. So for example, companies like Tencent and Alibaba Cloud. There have been a couple of theories about why these CSPs are specifically targeted. It could be the case that it's simply due to location of the attackers and familiarity with the CSPs in their region. However, I suspect that since many of these CSPs are newer than, for example, AWS, Google Cloud, and Azure, the security controls that are in place are perhaps not as mature as other service providers, making it more likely that instances will be deployed in an insecure fashion. Now, if you're someone that follows cloud security research, you're probably bored to death at this point by a family of cryptojacking shell scripts. But with CoinStomp, we noticed some interesting techniques which hinted at the attacker's awareness of cloud security measures and the incident response process. These included the use of timestamp manipulation, otherwise known as time stomping, an attempt to remove system cryptographic policies in order to weaken the target system, C2 communication via a reverse shell, and a reference to a prior crypto jacking campaign, potentially in an attempt to foil attribution. So the first thing that caught our eye when analyzing a coin stomp payload was the presence of this date time string, which you can see passed in as a parameter to the touch commands dash T option. Now hopefully you can actually see that, but I've highlighted the relevant section in the screenshot. So the function on screen here begins with an existence check for the file user bin mod user. If this isn't found, the script then grips for a sequence of strings found in the chmod binary in a subshell and uses grep's dash l option to return the file name only. We can see evidence of this on line 16. It then renames the chmod binary to mod user and runs the touch command with dash t and a date time string of 22.23 on the 20th of May 2019. Now this may be common knowledge to some people in the room, but this is of course a pretty nice way to perform time stomping with a command that's virtually ubiquitous across Unix-like systems. On line 21, we see the exact same technique employed for the chatter or change attributes command, except this time with a slightly different date time string. Now why is the malware in this case obfuscating usage of chatter and chmod in the first place? Well, of course, both of these commands are specific to file access control. Most cloud native malware campaigns assume that, assume that certain files of interest will be restricted for editing either via file attributes or permissions. Using the chmod and ch chatter commands to overcome this is the most ov obvious way to modify these permissions or attributes. And this is why we see it in virtually all malicious shell scripts that we analyze. In this particular case, the touch command updates both the modified and access timestamps to the date time hard coded in the shell script. And we verified this later after analyzing a machine with this malware running on it in Kazo. However, with this particular flag, the created time still remains correct. It seems likely that this was an attempt to obfuscate usage of the chatter and chmod command line tools as some forensics tools may prioritize files recently accessed or executed when building a timeline of events. Using a copy of these system binaries also avoids alerting admins who may have set up monitoring for execution of things like chatter and chmod. So this was another interesting technique employed by CoinStump for the purpose of evading detection at the network level. The function curl that you can see on screen here is used to retrieve additional payloads and communicate information about the target back to a C2 server. On line four, we can see a reverse shell connection being established via the dev TCP device file to a remote server at 106.53.115.114. Now for those that don't know, the dev TCP device file is a feature commonly found in Linux distributions. In combination with the exec command, it allows you to specify a file descriptor, in this case three, 
which can be used for read-write operations via a socket to the specified IP. As you can imagine, this is very useful for anyone wishing to implement a C2 communications channel, and it's natively supported across Linux systems. In the example on screen, the malware makes use of port 443, which is of course the port used for HTTPS traffic. It's likely that this port was chosen as it's commonly used and unlikely to be blocked by any outbound firewall rules in the target environment. So this was an interesting and unexpected finding when analyzing the CoinStomp payloads. CoinStomp made use of cron as a persistence mechanism and registered a cron job under the root user. However, rather than using this persistence to launch or relaunch malicious payloads, as most malware would, CoinStomp instead used a cron job to kill the tail and mass scan utilities, the latter of which is often used in these types of campaigns to find vulnerable servers to target. We noticed an interesting commented line in this cron job, which you may be able to make out on line 243. At one point, it seems as if the code hosting service Anon Pasta was used to host an additional payload for the CoinStomp campaign. We can see on line 243 that the URL for this provider is still added to the cron job, but it's commented out, resulting in it having no effect on the job itself. When we visited the URL, we found another URL pointing to the Anon DNS anonymous DNS provider. This URL contained a couple of strings that we recognized from a prior campaign, the first of which was Xanthe, a crypto mining campaign discovered by Cisco Talos. Furthermore, one of the payloads in the Xanthe campaign that we'd analyzed was called FCZYO, which is the same as the resource in the URL here. Now, unfortunately, the URL was down when we attempted to retrieve the FCYZO payload, so we couldn't determine whether it was the same installation script as we'd seen in the Xanthe campaign. We also didn't notice any overlap of infrastructure between these campaigns or anything else that would suggest that they were linked. So this led us to conclude that the URL likely contained those names in an attempt to foil attribution. Finally, to round off our overview of CoinStump, we noticed this rather interesting and amusing spelling mistake when statically analyzing the custom version of XM Rig that the CoinStomp scripts dropped. We're not sure if this is deliberate or not, but it was jokingly suggested that it could be a reference to British crime actor Jason Statham, who may well have had some involvement in this campaign. So I've included a photo of him on the next slide for visual reference. <laughs> so let's move on now to discuss Watchdog. Watchdog is a name that any follower of cloud security research will, li will likely be familiar with. They are a cloud-native adversary group known for conducting crypto-jacking campaigns since at least 2019. Watchdog are opportunistic and generally target misconfigured services such as Docker and Redis, as we discussed in the infection vector slide. Now, they often make use of internet scanning utilities to conduct wide-ranging scans of the IP address space, searching for vulnerable servers to infect. Several of their TTPs overlap with those of Team TNT, occasionally making attribution difficult. They've even gone as far as using Team TNT ASCII art in some of their scripts, and have included the, team, the TNT string in their naming conventions. Similar to what we saw with the CoinStomp campaign, watchdog campaigns typically make use of Linux-specific knowledge and living off the LAN techniques to evade detection. So this was a fairly interesting technique that we discovered in a campaign attributed to Watchdog that targeted our honeypot infrastructure. It utilizes a similar time stomping technique as we saw in our overview of CoinStomp. But, and perhaps more interestingly, we can see the attackers implementing a very rudimentary, albeit effective, process hider. First, the binary for PS is copied to another file named PSLanagiro. 
A very simple shell script is then written to bin PS, the sole purpose of which is to call the renamed PS binary and pipe it through an inverse grep to filter out processes with the strings DDNS and scan in the name. Now, as you might expect, DDNS and scan are two malicious processes run by the malware. Amazingly, this actually works, and it's perhaps the most unitary process hider I've ever seen. But more importantly, this demonstrates that you don't need fancy rootkits to have effective detective evasion. So this was another very simple but effective technique employed by Watchdog for hiding artifacts on the target system. When analyzing their payloads, we saw multiple references to paths containing directories that were named with three full stops or an ellipsis. It turns out that this name is perfectly valid for files and directories on Linux systems, and it has the added benefit of looking similar to the two dot alias for the parent directory in long listings. So as you can see on the screen here, the ellipsis directory is hidden and could easily be mistaken for the parent directory by an unsuspecting admin. Now obviously this won't fool proper EDR solutions, but in cloud compute instances or containers where you may be manually investigating a breach, this is the kind of thing that could be easily overlooked. So this technique seems to be a favorite amongst cloud threat actors, and we saw it in use during the CoinStomp campaign and several other cloud native campaigns. In this screenshot, we can see existence checks for a file named CD1. Now, this is actually a version of curl that's been renamed in order to obfuscate its usage. The malware then sets an environment variable with the path to the renamed version of curl so that any attempts to retrieve additional payloads make use of CD1 and not the curl binary itself. It's difficult to see just how effective this would be. But I suppose if you're monitoring for invocations of curl, then it's a way for an attacker to avoid generating an alert. This technique has also been observed when obfuscating usage of other data transfer utilities such as wget. Now, aside from the techniques we'd observed ourselves in the campaign against our honeypot, we also heard about another detection evasion technique attributed to Watchdog. Now, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with the concept of steganography. If not, then it can be briefly summarized as the practice of concealing executable code within another file. When it comes to malware, the other file is typically an image file, as these are usually considered benign and non-executable. This allows the embedded code to be delivered stealthily to the target machine, acting as an additional malicious payload. We encountered some interesting research from Lacework when uncovering information about prior Watchdog campaigns. They had found an example of a campaign where Watchdog had used this rather low resolution image of the 63 building in Seoul to conceal an additional payload. The first stage payload retrieved this image and used the Unix DD utility to skip to the end of the file and extract a malicious shell script. Sure enough, when viewing the image file in a hex editor, a malicious shell script had been appended to the end of the file, starting after bytes representing the letters I, E, N, D. This, of course, denotes the end of a PNG file. So the script itself contains behaviors typical of Watchdog, including disabling of SE Linux and monitoring agents associated with Alibaba Cloud modification and deletion of IP tables rules, and of course, the persistent installation of XMRIG for the purpose of illicitly mining Monero. Steganography like this is somewhat rare on non-Windows systems. Although it's a technique as old as time when it comes to malware, it demonstrates Watchdog's willingness to adapt and try out new techniques for awaiting detection. Excuse me. And now on to our final malware family, Denonia. Denonia was a malware family we encountered when hunting for samples 
that interacted with the AWS IMDS endpoint. It's notable due to it being the first publicly analyzed malware sample specifically targeting AWS Lambda. Now, Lambda is AWS's serverless computing platform, meaning that it's a service provided by AWS where users can execute code in response to events, and the underlying infrastructure is managed by AWS themselves. The discovery of Denonia suggests cloud adversary groups are now beginning to target serverless environments, which made this quite an interesting find. So the malware itself is delivered as an ELF binary written in Golang. Unfortunately, it's yet another cryptojacking sample, but it uses interesting address resolution techniques for command and control. It also includes other detection evasion techniques, which hint at the author's knowledge of cloud technologies. So to give some background on our analysis of Denonia, we discovered an ELF binary named Python, which, despite the name, was actually written in Go. Static analysis of the binary revealed a number of interesting packages, including one named AWS Lambda Go. This turned out to be the official AWS package for writing Lambda functions in Golang and included libraries, samples, and tools. Of course, this immediately made us interested, as it definitely seemed like this malware was intended to be executed in Lambda. Continuing with static analysis, we found several references to XMRig within the binary, which turned out to be from an embedded, customized version of the miner. Not only that, but the miner itself appeared to be executed in memory with a config file written to slash temp, and we'll come back to that later in the talk. So with static analysis complete, we moved on to executing the sample itself. Shortly after execution, the Denonia process exited, and we were greeted with the log statement that you can see on the slide here. This made us even more excited than we were before, as these environment variables referenced in the log statement are specific to Lambda. We soon knew that we were dealing with the first publicly disclosed malware sample to target serverless environments. Now, in keeping with the theme of this talk, we discovered a number of detection evasion techniques utilized by the Denonia developers. Our work at the static analysis stage had revealed a Go package named DOH Go. This, of course, turned out to be a protocol implementing DNS over HTTPS in the Go language. The package allows you to interact with DOH as a client from your Go application, and it supports providers such as Cloudflare, Google, Quad9, and DNSPod. For anyone that doesn't know, DNS over HTTPS effectively allows you to send DNS queries via the HTTPS protocol. This means that the DNS queries are encrypted in transit, preventing them from being sent in plain text, as they typically are when vanilla DNS resolution occurs. <coughs> Excuse me. Use of Denonia in malware is relatively newsworthy in its own right. While Denonia isn't the first malware discovered making use of it, it certainly isn't a common occurrence. So what advantages does leveraging DOH give to the Denonia authors? For one, AWS would be unable to see the DNS lookups for the malicious domain, preventing the malware from triggering an alert. And depending on how your VPC is configured, DNS requests from lambdas may be prevented. The screenshot you can see in the slide here demonstrates a DOH request that we observed the malware making. As you can see, the requested domain includes the string Denonia, which is how the malware got its name. We can see that the request is made to dns.google.com, and it's clear from the URL that's where the resolution is performed. Once the request was made, 
we observed the DOH server responding with some JSON that included the IP that the domain resolved to. You can see an example of this on the slide here. So once Denonia received this response, the IP was then written to a hidden file named xmrig.json under the slash temp directory. This was interesting in a Lambda context because slash temp is the only directory that you're permitted to write to. We'd also observed the malware updating the home environment variable to a value of slash temp, essentially setting the user's home directory there. It's likely this was to ensure that XMRig functioned as intended. With XMRig running in memory, communication is established between the compromised Lambda and a custom mining pool. The mining pool resided at the IP 116.203.4.0 and utilized port 3333. The screenshot shows the JSON request body for the initial mining pool request. The pool then responds with the status of the mining job as can be seen on this slide. So we touched on this already, but as I'm sure many of you know, the only file system storage available for use by Lambda is the slash temp directory. Data stored in slash temp is preserved for the lifetime of the execution environment and can be reused by multiple Lambda invocations. Given the ephemeral nature of Lambda functions, items stored in slash temp are probably the closest you can get to persistence. So this is beneficial to those behind Denonia, as Lambda functions are only granted a runtime of 15 minutes per invocation. Obviously, this isn't very useful for operating a miner, so having a config file persist across invocations allows multiple Lambda functions to be run with the same miner configuration. This, of course, increases overall mining time, which results in more Monero for the attackers. Finally, this was an interesting discovery that we made during static analysis of the Denonia binary and subsequent variants. The screenshot that you can see in this slide shows a number of user agents and HTTP request strings. There were thousands of lines of these, far more than indicated by the screenshot. At first, we thought that this might be indicative of botnet or DDoS activity, but both static and dynamic analysis showed that they, they weren't actually used by the malware. We're now under the impression that these were used to pad the binary helping it to evade EDR and malware analysis tools with file size limits. Since Denonia is already written in Go, the size of the binaries is quite large. Adding this extra padding could be enough to push it over certain file size limits and defensive tools. It could also be used to confuse eager analysts like myself, obscuring the true objectives of the malware. So to summarize, we've looked at three distinct cloud native malware campaigns, all of which employ interesting detection evasion techniques. Although all three of these campaigns have the common objective of cryptojacking, we've seen that the methods used to achieve this objective differ. Linux specific knowledge is evident in each of the campaigns we've discussed, which is to be expected given that the cloud essentially runs on Linux. Cloud native attackers rely heavily on living off the land techniques and use simple Linux utilities to craft custom process hiders and obfuscate their payloads. Most of the payloads we've seen are shell script based, which makes them easier to detect and analyze. But despite this, the campaigns are widespread and effective. Perhaps the most interesting example is Denonia, not only is it a binary payload, but we've seen the developers target Lambda specifically, potentially signaling a move to serverless environments for these types of attacks. We also saw the Denonia developers make use of relatively advanced techniques, such as binary padding, in-memory execution, and DNS over HTTPS. 
These techniques would be notable in regular Linux malware, never mind malware specifically targeting Lambda. So this shows that we'll likely continue to see cloud native campaigns mature and develop in technical sophistication. Now, if you're interested to learn more about cloud security, then here are a list of references that we used when conducting research for this talk. I've included interesting blogs from NetLab 360, Unit 42, Lacework, and Anomaly. These organizations are all well worth following if you're a fan of cloud security research or you work in this area. Now, here's a list of our own blogs that we published about the malware families in this talk. You can find these and many more in the blog section of our website, kdosecurity.com slash blogs. Finally, let me leave you with these three key takeaways from this talk. We're currently at an interesting point in cloud malware research, where campaigns targeting cloud infrastructure are still lacking somewhat in technicality. This is good news for defenders as many of the techniques used in these campaigns are easily mitigated and detectable. However, the payloads themselves don't need to be hugely technical if they're effective. The example from Johnny Platt, the developer that was unexpectedly billed $45,000, demonstrates that these types of campaigns are indeed effective and can have a big impact. Which brings me to my next takeaway, the success of these campaigns depends heavily on mistakes made by customers of CSPs. With this, I refer to the deployment of misconfigured services such as Docker and Redis, as we mentioned. Automated scanners looking for security misconfigurations in these services are scanning the internet at a rapid rate. To illustrate this, when we first deployed a Redis and Docker honeypot, it was compromised in only 12 minutes. So I'll leave you with this third point to finish off. Cloud threat actors are becoming increasingly sophisticated, and that's clear from the three campaigns discussed today. Although payloads are typically delivered as shell scripts, we've seen cases where cloud threat actors have deployed more advanced Linux malware, such as Tsunami and Kinsing. This makes me suspect that eventually, we'll start to see a shift away from cryptojacking and on to more nefarious activities. So I hope that everyone enjoyed my talk today, and thanks a lot for coming to see it. I don't think we've quite got time for questions, but please feel free to contact me on Twitter if you have any. I think you can also message me via the Black Cat Events app as well, so I'm happy to answer any questions there. So thanks again, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.